Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 12 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In this particular lecture, we will be discussing about how to go ahead primarily with quantification of seismic hazard analysis following deterministic approach. In earlier lectures, we have discussed in detail primarily about the reason for earthquake occurrence, then whenever earthquakes are happening on a particular source, how to characterize that particular source, how to identify and express the dominating fault mechanism on a particular fault. And as we have also discussed that in a particular region of interest, once we are interested to find out the expected level of ground shaking which can be used for earthquake resistant design of buildings, for quantification of induced effects and even in case if you are going for ground improvement, what should be the expected level of ground shaking for which one can design uh, 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 strategy for ground improvement. So, all these things we have discussed in earlier lecture and then we also discussed about fault plane solutions both starting with which was solution then discussing about stereo nets. Overall objective if we take into account from lecture 1 to 11 was primarily related to how earthquakes are happening, where earthquakes are happening, what are the important sources on which earthquakes have been reported in the past, how one can go with identification of such sources. So, that we can once we are going for deta detailed uh, hazard assessment in a particular region, we should be having a clear cut idea about what are the sources which can be considered as active sources and taking into account the past uh, of earthquake occurrence that means seismic history of a particular region, we will be in a better condition even to assign uh, the value of seismic activity parameters in a particular region as well as on a particular source seismic source. This will give an indication about how frequently earthquakes have been happening throughout the history of known seismicity in a particular region or on a particular source. So, this is about earthquake occurrence, but finally whenever we are going with respect to quantification of induced effect, whenever we are going for uh, characterization earthquake loading for seismic design of buildings, we have to have an understanding about what should be the level of ground motion one has to take into account such that this ground motion I should take for building design, this is the ground motion for which I have to check my site related to uh, may be slope stability problem, may be related to liquefaction, may be related to ground improvement or and same way in terms of any other induced effects. So, we have to find out basically what is the expected level of ground motion. This expected level of ground motion is generally classified as seismic hazard analysis. So, in today's lecture we will be discussing primarily about what is hazard and then we will moving we will be moving gently towards seismic hazard analysis and then specifically about deterministic seismic hazard analysis. So, deterministic seismic hazard analysis is the topic which we will be discussing in today's lecture that is lecture number 12. Now, if we recall the discussions which we did in lecture 11, we primarily focused on that the characteristics of ground motion during a particular earthquake is the collective effect of what is happening at the source and what are the parameter which can approximate the source mechanism by means of different different measurements. Then the seismic wave which started from the source will be propagating through different medium primarily the crystal medium and geometric spreading heat heterogeneity which will be encountered by the seismic waves when passing through a particular medium. So, we will be having some parameters which are used to characterize the propagation medium. Thirdly, once the waves seismic waves reach to a particular uh, site, again there will be weathered rock, there will be engineering rock, then different soil stratifications which are available between the location where the seismic wave have just arrived through the crystal medium from the source and where your building is located, where your tunnel is located, where your any underground or superstructure is located. So, in order to take that particular ground motion we have discussed that one can refer to available ground motion prediction equations which are empirical correlations. These empirical correlations are going to give you a direct indication about what is the expected level of ground motion at my site of interest 
when some earthquake of magnitude m has happened at certain epicentral distance or hypocentral distance or any other measure of distance parameter. So, this is going to give you an indication about what is the expected level of ground motion. We generally refer to it as spectral acceleration in general. So, depending upon the period of interest that means, the period corresponding to the natural frequency of the system we can have different different values of spectral acceleration. So, the spectral acceleration is a function of natural period of the structure. If we go with respect to design response spectra which are given in earthquake resistant uh, design related codes, we will be seeing that the spectral acceleration which is plotted on y axis is basically a function of natural period of the structure or structure or any uh, it can be a concrete structure, it can be stratification beneath the ground surface. So, depending upon the period of the natural period of the structure, one can pick up using the design response spectra what should be the value of spectral acceleration. So, that means overall whenever we are going with hazard analysis, we are interested to find out corresponding to different different natural frequencies or natural period of the structures, what is the expected level of ground shaking. This ground shaking is indication of the approximate ground shaking which is likely to occur considering what are the important sources available within your periphery or within your seismotectonic province or within your seismotectonic map. This seismotectonic map as discussed in earlier class also related to source characterization, the range of or the radial distance of seismotectonic map may vary from may be 300 kilometer to 500, 600 kilometer depending upon the importance of the site depending upon the seismic activity of your surrounding region. So, seismic hazard analysis before going to seismic hazard analysis let us discuss what is hazard. So, hazard generally refers to a potentially damaging physical event any event which is happening physically it may be related to ground shaking it may be related to fire it may be because of blasting it may be terrorist attack anything which is responsible. So, it may be a natural phenomena or it may be a human activity as I mentioned also related to uh, explosion may be related to uh, bombing. So, those are also part of hazard, but those will be called as anthropogenic activities and which are happening because of natural reasons like uh, tsunami, like fire, like flood, drought, earthquake. So, all these things will come under uh, broader category of natural hazards. So, hazard can further be classified into natural hazard which are responsible or the phenomena which are happening naturally those are called as natural hazards and there can be anthropogenic hazard or human hazard, human based hazard. In both the cases these are called as hazard because every time there is an uh, there is uh, hazard occurring it will result in loss of lives there will be casualties there will be people who are getting injured then at the same time there will be economic loss and at the same time third one will be property damage of building damage. So, first one is loss to lives, second one is economic losses, you, you might be having some bridges undergoing collapse, you might be having some buildings undergoing collapse. So, property damages and collectively because of property damages there will be lot of economic losses. So, whenever there is a hazard hitting your site of interest may be city or a region we, we, we might come across some uh, reports from time to time like because of a particular war this was the uh, economic loss or during a particular earthquake these many casualties building damages were there and now a significant amount of finance is going into rehabilitation works. So, there again the money which otherwise would have been used directly for developing better infrastructure now significant portion of that money is going into. Uh, rehabilitation work and restoration of at least basic uh, infrastructure in the uh, affected area. So, hazard can be classified as any phenomena which is happening naturally or maybe by means of human interventions. Primarily, it is leading to loss of lives, even injury can be accounted because of earthquake uh, or any other 
natural or human uh, based hazard, property damages and at times socio-economic disruptions are also there, environmental consequences or environmental degradations are also uh, an outcome or consequence of occurrence of hazard both anthropogenic as well as natural hazard. So, as this is the definition of hazard which is as per ISDR secretariat. So, hazard can include even we can take into account what is the latest condition, what is the existing condition or latent condition in a particular region which also gives an indirect indication about what might be the future related to a particular hazard. It can be because of growing economic crisis, it can be because of uh, conflict between uh, two uh, nearby uh, economies or it can be anything which is liable uh, likely to occur in near future primarily because of high seismic potential of a particular region. So, we have to be uh, the policy makers have to be always ready in terms of taking into consideration that there is possibility that certain natural or anthropogenic uh, activities are likely to hit my site of interest, hit my region of interest and I should be better prepared for these kinds of situations such that if we are going to be better prepared well in advance, at least we will be in better situation to deal with the, 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 the casualties in terms of economic losses, in terms of building damages in order to supply uh, essential commodities, medical teams medicines, foods and even in, in case of uh, strategy making, we can also locate important structures like medical camps, rehabilitation plants to relatively safer locations. So, so keeping in account what is the existing condition in a particular region, that is also going to give you an indication about what are the potential possible future threats which are likely to hit your site of interest. Maybe we can, we can forecast for uh, 20, 30, 40 years depending upon how much information is known to us and how much finance is involved which, which, which helps us in uh, uh, narrowing down to suitable decisions in order to forecast for next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So, it can be also used in terms of planning of important infrastructure, planning of important cities to so, taking all those induced as well as natural hazards into account. Now, each hazard whenever we say it is characterized primarily we can take hazard means either it is natural hazard or man made hazard we can say what are the locations which are potential or prone to such hazards, what is the intensity whether we can say it is moderate hazard, low hazard. So, we are talking about different hazard and corresponding to each hazard suppose fire where it is most likely to occur that is going to give you the location again when there is fire breakout what is the intensity of that particular breakout. Thirdly, what is the frequency at which we are witnessing these kinds of hazards? Avalanche is there that is again uh, natural hazard uh, unless it is triggered by means of some human intervention. So, what is the frequency at which these kinds of natural phenomena are, are occurring and that certainly is going to give you an indication about what is the probability that we may experience or a particular society or our infrastructure will be exposed to a set of natural or human uh, based hazards. When we go for hazard analysis, we are interested to find out potentially the sources where it is going to happen and its assessment, how big will be the hazard, how repeated, uh, how frequently the hazard is going to get repeated and subsequently we are able to narrow down to important sources of certain, uh, the particular hazard that means, if you are talking about avalanche what are the potential locations through which avalanche is likely to occur may, may be like uh, next 5 years, 6 years like that. If you are talking about slope stability, what are the important slopes which are just on the brink of failure. So, we can go with in situ monitoring and that will give us some uh, early warnings in terms if there is some slope stability which is going to happen in near future. Similarly, related to tsunami also there are lot of tsunami warning systems in uh, different parts. So, similarly the, with respect to earthquakes also lot of uh, early warning systems are in place uh, in specific countries which, which primarily help in uh, uh, the humans to go to shelters and prevent themselves from falling debris or any other induced effects of earthquakes. 
if there are high speed trains then those come to complete halt rather than running followed by uh, uh, ground vibration because of earthquake. So, those trains will come to complete halt primarily because of certain warnings which are uh, generated during earthquake early warning systems to those uh, uh, utilities. So, seismic hazards when we talk about we are interested to find out the expected level of ground shaking which are liable for damage to properties because there is a building, there is an infrastructure and when we are talking about seismic hazard we are basically interested to find out what is the potential ground shaking which is likely to occur at your site of interest or which is likely to hit your infrastructure or a building or tunnel or maybe transmission tower. So, what is that particular expected level of ground shaking? So, seismic hazard means any hazard which is happening because of seismic activity or primarily earthquakes which are responsible for uh, damage to property as well as casualties. Seismic hazard analysis when we are talking about as the name suggests we are analyzing using uh, source information, seismic source information, using past earthquake information, using regional parameters indicating how the source propagation path and site characteristics can be accounted for future earthquakes, taking into account the past experience of earthquakes in the region, so that one can come up with quantitative assessment of expected ground shaking at your site of interest. So, I will be better, uh, I will be in a better situation once I do seismic hazard analysis that my site located at such x and y coordinate based on hazard analysis. Now, I know my building is exposed to a ground motion of maybe 0 0.12 g, 0 0.2 g, 0 0.25 g like that. So, where 0 0.2 is uh, into uh, g is the value of acceleration, peak ground acceleration which my building is supposed to be experienced if the seismic hazard is experienced by the building. So, generally these studies are again related to other hazards also when we are going with seismic hazard analysis these are very specific to a particular site because as we know with respect to seismic sources if the location of the site keeps changing depending upon the distance, depending upon the orientation of the site with respect to fault orientation the ground motion characteristics will change. So, this is again we are talking about some scenario earthquake. So, we are interested to find out whether it can be a maximum ground shaking or whether it can be most likely to occur ground shaking which is going to hit my building, which is going to hit my infrastructure during its design life. Primarily we will be interested to, uh, to uh, ensure the safety of the building during the design life for routine buildings. If we are going with important structure, even uh, uh, we have to be more uh, sure about any kind of minimum uh, level of damage should not be created in such buildings. So, there the finance will not be a deciding criteria, uh, criteria rather the safety of the infrastructure will be the deciding criteria. So, the knowledge of seismic hazard analysis for a particular region is beneficial. Why we require? Because now once we are going for design of a particular infrastructure we know what is the expected level of ground shaking in the near future at least during the design life of the structure. So, if the design life of the structure is 30 year based on seismic hazard analysis I am telling in next 20 years, 30 years what is the maximum ground motion or what is the most likely to occur ground motion to hit my site of interest. If I am going to design my building for that infrastructure uh, that level of ground shaking certainly when this ground shaking is going to hit my building, my building will remain safe it will not undergo minor damages, complete collapse. As a result, we are actually minimizing the damages as well as fatalities. So, right now we will be discussing about hazard analysis. Later on, hazard analysis is going to give you what is the amplitude of ground shaking because of earthquakes likely to occur in a particular region. Taking this into account and also taking into account the building classification, we can continue this study towards vulnerability as well as risk assessment. So, later on it can be also led to reduction in the economic losses because we have forecasted accurately about the expected level of ground shaking, we have taken into account the building classification, we have also taken into account its intended use by its uh, users. So, we can continue this related to vulnerability and risk assessment 
which will be covered in lecture uh, uh, in later lectures of this particular course. So, seismic hazard analysis it rationally estimates the possible seismic scenario at a site of interest taking into consideration that this scenario is going to be witnessed during the future earthquakes. Also taking into account, so when we say about scenario for future earthquakes definitely a significant inputs in terms of magnitude of the earthquake in terms of potential location which can uh, trigger earthquake in near future also significantly depends upon where the earthquakes had happened in the past, how bigger was those earthquakes and thirdly how frequently those earthquakes were happening. So, if we refer to the lecture where we are talking about uh, determining the minimum magnitude as well as maximum potential earthquake on a particular source so that is certainly going to give you that what is the maximum potential each source is capable of producing an earthquake and once we know the true potential definitely we will expect like this particular source or fault will produce a particular magnitude earthquake even when the building is at a particular site of interest. Separately we will be assigning that this is the potential, but what is the probability this, this maximum magnitude will occur or will not occur during the design life of the structure or during the period at least where the structure is in its in, uh, in situ position and trying to cover its design life. So, available seismic sources in the vicinity certainly will be taken into consideration unless because uh, if seismic sources are there certainly these are going to narrow down the potential locations for future earthquake occurrence. So, seismic sources also we have to take into account, we have to take into account the location or the distance uh, which have shown earthquake in the past and the magnitude of the earthquake. The final outcome in seismic hazard analysis will be the seismic hazard map. So, just like your contour maps which gives you points joining uh, locations of equal elevation, in seismic hazard maps we will be having contour maps joining the points having same value of seismic hazard. Primarily if we are going with deterministic hazard analysis, we will be having some points which are, uh, which are indication of same level of p ground acceleration or spectral acceleration. So, those are called as seismic hazard maps. Now, depending upon where uh, we, we have discussed actually in ground motion prediction equation that whenever we are going with ground motion prediction equation, this ground motion prediction equation, it is going to give you the expected level of ground shaking due to particular magnitude earthquake m happening at certain hypocentral distance r and depending upon whether the GMP is going to give you the value of ground motion parameter at bedrock level or outcrop level or specific site level. That means, you have to take into consideration what is site class at the top of which your uh, GMP is going to give you the ground motion. So, accordingly we can say if my ground motion prediction equation I have taken into hazard analysis gives me the value of ground motion at bedrock level certainly my hazard map is corresponding to bedrock condition. If my GMP is going to give me value corresponding to outcrop uh, level, then your seismic hazard map which you are developing based on using this particular GMP will give you hazard map corresponding to your outcrop level. Similarly, if you are talking about site class A, B, C, D, E, so you can refer to any HRB site class uh, classification. So, if your ground motion prediction equation is determining your ground motion parameter related to each any of these site classes and you are using that particular ground motion prediction equation in seismic hazard analysis certainly your seismic hazard map will be corresponding to that particular site class. Many a times people are confused with respect to uh, which particular site class your seismic hazard map is valid for. So, that answer to that particular question lies in the condition for which the ground motion prediction equation has been developed. If your ground motion prediction equation is developed for site class A condition, definitely your hazard map will be also corresponding to site class A condition. If it is correspond, the GMP is corresponding to bedrock condition, your seismic hazard level will be also corresponding to bedrock condition. So, seismic hazard is considered as severity or repeatability depending upon what methodology you are using. So, how big is the ground shaking? 
how high is the ground shaking repeatability how frequently this ground shaking is expected to hit your site of interest generally it is referred to the inertial forces because there will be ground shaking there is mass involved mass of the superstructure is involved which is actually undergoing some kind of shaking so inertial force will take it into consideration and it is corresponding to ground deformation at times if you are talking about induced effects there are failures such as liquefaction landslide avalanche tsunami which are also the effect of when the system is responding to uh, seismic waves so this will also give you an indication about how big will be the shaking and how frequently the shaking is likely to occur at your site of interest so factors which can affect your uh, seismic hazard at a particular site include the magnitude of the earthquake the magnitude means if in a, in a particular region of 300 or 400 km radial distance around your site of interest what are the magnitudes of past earthquake which have triggered and taking those into consideration and referring to previous lectures we can find out what is the maximum potential earthquake which a particular seismic source or a fault or an aerial source or a point source is capable of producing when we are taking seismic source into consideration another parameter which will come into uh, the, the assessment or understanding is how far is that particular source with respect to your site so if my site is located somewhere over here and i have number of seismic sources so corresponding to each of these sources what is the distance now depending upon the methodology you are using for hazard analysis we will be taking sometimes minimum distance sometime all the distance into consideration while uh, using them in suitable ground motion prediction equation to determine the ground motion parameter third part is earthquake rate of occurrence that means how frequently earthquakes are happening into uh, on that particular seismic source so we can refer to seismic activity parameters which have been discussed in earlier lectures so seismic activity parameters in the end you will get what is the amplitude of ground shaking can also get what is the duration significantly for which ground motion you can you can generate actually those ground motion using uh, synthetic ground motion model and correspondingly we can also find out uh, the spectral acceleration at different different periods as i mentioned uh, depending upon the ground motion prediction equation here we are using we can comment on that seismic hazard values are corresponding to what site condition the representation of seismic hazard values it is primarily done uh, in three in terms of three parameters so in most of the cases seismic hazard level is represented in terms of values like the amplitude or probability density uh, probability distribution uh, in terms of how frequently a particular ground motion will exceed or will not exceed during the design life so depending upon the methodology you are using you can go with the values specific values or you can go with what is the frequency of such values to get repeated during the design life which is again user defined so there we can go with probabilistic hazard analysis uh, probabilistic hazard analysis will be covered in uh, lecture 13 so in today's one we will be discussing about deterministic one but in a nutshell when we are going with hazard analysis we can we can perform hazard analysis in terms of acceleration values that means it's going to give us how a particular site is experiencing uh, uh, acceleration because of ground vibrations why because it's going to give us basically the inertial force for the infrastructure because the product of the mass which is undergoing disturbance with respect to the acting acceleration because of vibrations at a corresponding site condition it's going to give us what is the magnitude of inertial force acting on your Uh, targeted infrastructure acting on your targeted uh, maybe underground stratifications many times we have seen that peak ground accelerations generally occur in certain frequency pulse which is happening at not regular interval during the design history of the time the time duration of ground vibration 
as a result the peak value will be only corresponding to small fraction of energy so acceleration values which we are taking into consideration it's not suitable as a single parameter related to ground motion representation so in addition to peak value at times we will also be taking into account the corner frequency cut off frequency maybe bracketed duration so these are the durations uh, or the definition which will give us more clear idea about the 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 duration properties of your ground motion similarly we can go with the velocity values even when ground motion recordings are happening generally it's like how the displacement values are changing with respect to time at your recording station subsequently based on recorded ground uh, displacement values we can estimate velocity values we can estimate acceleration values by means of differentiating the uh, former values so peak ground velocity is also at times available in the ground motion record if it is not available then using integration of acceleration time histories or differentiation of displacement time histories also one can get to know about how much is the peak ground velocity values now at a particular site if peak ground velocity is available the product of the square of peak ground velocity and the mass of the structure undergoing uh, deformation or undergoing uh, showing some kind of response that is going to give you how much is the kinetic energy of the mass which is undergoing disturbance usually it has been seen that for longer uh, uh, for shorter uh, uh, uh i mean ground motion of smaller amplitude is generally result in longer duration or we can say like when we are talking about intermediate frequency natural structures or the structures which are having natural frequency in intermediate range those are more susceptible to velocity related ground motions third one is displacement so as i mentioned most of the time when we take up any particular recording station it's going to give us the ground motion as how the displacement is changing with respect to time at your particular recording station when the seismic waves are passing through particular recording station so peak ground displacement or pgd and at times we also get uh response spectral displacements so these are basically an indication of uh it's like generally useful in terms of longer periods so particularly those structure which are having natural frequencies uh, very very long uh, natural uh, uh, periods those are more susceptible to ground motions uh, displacement based ground motions so we can say that damage to high natural uh, period structure the structure which are having very high natural period or very low natural frequency those structures the design will be displacement based so ground velocity ground acceleration and ground displacement as i mentioned depending upon the record if there is displacement time history you can go with velocity and acceleration time history based on differentiation you will get from displacement to velocity again go for differentiation then you will get from velocity to acceleration value if you are having acceleration time history then you go with integration you will get velocity time history further integrate you will get displacement time histories so that's how we can correlate but as i mentioned that displacement time histories are more sensible or more affecting to longer period structures velocities we can target for intermediate structures uh, or the structure with the intermediate natural frequencies and the acceleration time histories are corresponding to the structure which are corresponding to very low natural periods so methodology for seismic hazard analysis generally uh, there are two methodologies one is deterministic one seismic hazard analysis which is also called as deterministic seismic hazard analysis or dsha in this particular uh, methodology we will be calculating the expected level of ground shaking at your site of interest considering specific seismic sources take into consideration that these seismic sources will be dominated by one particular earthquake more precisely the maximum magnitude of the earthquake which the site is capable of producing again when we are taking highest magnitude which the site is capable of producing in order to maximize that effect we will take that this particular earthquake will be happening at minimum distance from the site so if this is your site and this is your seismic source 
then what we will do, we will try to find out where, what is the maximum potential earthquake because that is the maximum earthquake this site is capable of producing. How we are going to do this? We have already discussed in earlier lectures maximum potential earthquake magnitude. So, this is going to give us what is the maximum magnitude which is likely to occur which is which is which can occur at a particular site of interest. So, this is your seismic source or your fault. Now, when the uh, source is capable of producing or it is producing maximum potential earthquake, the effect on the particular site will be maximum when we consider that this particular earthquake or maximum potential magnitude is happening at minimum distance from the source such that this is going to give an indication like the distance is minimum, the magnitude is maximum and we know based on our understanding for ground motion prediction equation that when distance is minimum and magnitude is maximum, the ground motion parameter at a particular site will be maximum. So, in deterministic hazard analysis basically we are trying to find out what is the maximum scenario considering this I have given corresponding to one source similarly there will be n number of sources of different different orientation within your uh, seismo tectonic province. So, deterministic hazard analysis basically attempts to understand what is the overall maximum seismic scenario my site is capable of witnessing during its design life. Certainly, when we are talking about uh, maximum uh, ground amplitude that means, we are not at all interested that my site should undergo any kind of failure whether it is minor uh, cracks, whether it is uh, complete collapse we are not ready for any kind of uh, chance for failure. Probabilistic hazard analysis or probabilistic seismic hazard analysis incorporates on the other end. So, so what we understood in deterministic we are not taking into consideration that this maximum potential earthquake will occur during the design life or it will not occur because we know when, when you talk about larger magnitude earthquake those are not happening so frequently as low magnitude earthquake. So, if we are taking maximum potential earthquake that means that might be moderate earthquake, it might be great earthquake, it may be major earthquake, but as the magnitude of the earthquake increases it will be happening less frequently. It may happen or it may not happen during the design life of a structure which is maybe 35, 40 years. But because the safety is prime concern, we go with deterministic hazard analysis to find out what is the actual maximum ground motion which my site can experience irrespective of that this ground motion will, will be experienced or will not be experienced during the design life. So, there can be in actual scenario in practical situation there can be n number of scenarios that means, my site can produce minimum magnitude of maybe 4 earthquake, it can produce maybe 5 earthquake, it can produce 6 magnitude earthquake, it may produce 5.5 magnitude earthquake, it may produce 7.2. So, all these are the different magnitudes which my site based on my past experience or past earthquake uh, information, my site has shown indi uh, 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 an indication has given an indication that my site is capable of producing, my, my source is capable of producing all these different different magnitude earthquakes from time to time. So, when different magnitude earthquakes are possible to occur certainly there are also chances that similarly in near future also or at least during the design life of the structure my site will not only experience maximum magnitude earthquake, but some earthquake may be 5 magnitude, 6 magnitude also though the true potential of site is to produce may be 7.8 or 8.2 magnitude earthquake. But whether 7.8 and 2.8.2 point, point are the only earthquakes which will be happening at a particular site, certainly it will be not. So, what we will do in probabilistic hazard analysis, we will try to cover what are the different magnitude likely to occur and what are the associated uncertainty with respect to different magnitude. So, detailed discussion probabilistic hazard analysis we will do in lecture number uh, 13. And PSHA or the probabilistic hazard analysis was developed in uh, by uh, Cornell 1968. So, DSHA it is the earliest approach taken into consideration for seismic hazard analysis. Primarily it is used for nuclear power plant because in such a case I will be more interested as a designer that my facility nuclear containment facility or the, uh, the, the reactor building should not reach to a particular state where there may be any kind of radiation leak 
though we are having primary, secondary, tertiary uh, uh, safety measures, but at the same time I will design also my structure to maximum potential earthquake or to maximum amplitude of ground motion, my site is capable of experiencing taking the past history and without being worried about that it may or may not occur during the design life of the structure. Because there if the building undergoes even uh, failure, maybe minor cracks and there is radiation leak that will be uh, devastating. So, we, we do not want as a designer or as a concerned agency, we are not interested that there should be radiation leak. Rather, we will take the worst scenario which is likely to occur at my site of interest. So, that, that will uh, serve the purpose. So, some of the significant structure which for which deterministic hazard analysis is primarily used include nuclear power plants because radiation leak is there, larger dams again there is these are important structures. So, any kind of failure whether it is an earthen dam or whether it is a concrete dam, if there is crack developed uh, across the cross section then certainly we know that will subsequently lead to failure. Similarly, with respect to bridges also, these are important structures, lot of finance is also involved. So, when we are talking about larger bridges, in order to ensure that the safety of the structure should, re the, the structure should remain in intact, again we can uh, take into consideration what is the worst scenario uh, uh, which is, which my structure is exposed to at a particular site. Similarly, with respect to hazardous waste containment facilities also, we do not want these waste to undergo any kind of failure. So, any kind of containment facility should also be able to withstand the potential ground shaking which my site is prone to experience maybe in next 50 years, 100 years and generally uh, waste containment facilities are designed for to last much, much longer than nuclear power plants, dams, bridges as, as can be seen in some of the uh, nuclear waste containment facilities or hazardous waste containment facilities in the recent times. So, typically one or more earthquakes with respect to the site can be identified which are uh, which, which can which have happened along different sources. Now, usually the earthquakes are occurring at each source in deterministic hazard analysis at section of the fault which is closest to your site of interest as mentioned earlier also, if there is a fault running may be 600 kilometer length with respect to site, certainly during the design life it will not happen that the location which is closest to your site will undergo rupture. This particular section may undergo rupture, this particular section may undergo or any particular section may undergo rupture in order to produce may be 5, 5.5 magnitude earthquake and so on. So, actual rupture is happening over here, but worst scenario I am considering that rupture will be happening at a location within a fault which is indication of the closest distance and this, this is done in deterministic hazard analysis. So, the ground motion corresponding to maximum potential magnitude and happening at closest distance from the site, it is going to give me the worst scenario earthquake which is called as deterministically designed or uh, determined seismic hazard values. So, three basic elements related to hazard analysis and deterministic one is what is the location of seismic sources in and around of your site of interest, then what is the controlling magnitude of earthquake or we can say like what is the maximum potential earthquake which each of these earthquake source, it can be a fault, if fault is not identified we can take into consideration past earthquake information and try developing maybe aerial sources which, which which have been discussed in earlier lectures and uh, then by adopting suitable ground motion prediction equation, taking the earthquake magnitude and the epicentral distance or hypocentral distance or any other definition of distance which my ground motion prediction equation uses, we can we can develop the, uh, we can determine the ground motion parameter. So, the steps which are involved in ground motion uh, in deterministic hazard analysis, firstly one has to develop a seismotectonic map where all the active faults, at least the faults for which past earthquake information is known to us, we can take into consideration. If we have a map corresponding to um, uh, showing 
uh, all the active faults in a region, whether those have shown uh, an indication of earthquake occurrence in last 200, 300 years. If it is not, we can maybe assign minimum seismicity of uh, maybe 4, 4.5 to those faults and then take into consideration in hazard analysis or we can follow whatever the uh, uh, guidelines which are proposed by different agencies while performing the hazard analysis. So, overall if this is my site of interest for which I am interested to do seismic hazard analysis, I have basically found out all the seismic sources within your seismotectonic province. seismotectonic province or seismotectonic region or seismic sources which are located maybe within 500 kilometer radial distance with respect to site as the center. Then I found out like though in some locations well identified seismic sources or faults are known, there are some location in which though past earthquake information is there, but information about sources faults to be present in that particular region is not there. So, we can go ahead with the uh, seismic source characterization and then again find out these are the aerial sources which can be further taken into consideration while performing maybe deterministic hazard analysis or even in probabilistic hazard analysis. So, in this particular photo we are having actually uh, 4 seismic sources then define the geometry of those sources what is the length of those sources. So, depending upon the dimension we can even find out what is the maximum potential earthquake each of these source can produce using uh, uh, empirical correlations existing. So, which will go which will uh, help us in identifying maximum potential earthquake uh, on each seismic source. Then going to seismic uh, the step 2 we will find out what is the minimum distance. So, again we can see whenever this is aerial source depending upon the orientation of aerial source we can find out the location which is corresponding to minimum distance from the site. Now, in this particular source too, the minimum distance is somewhere in between uh, along this particular boundary, where perpendicular from the site can be drawn. However, another seismic source 3 is there, where we can see the minimum distance is corresponding to one corner of the one edge of the uh, seismic source. Similarly, with respect to linear source, depending upon the orientation of linear source with respect to site you can see for seismic source 1 the minimum distance will not be from any of the ends, but somewhere in between the ends where the perpendicular from the site is falling. So, that should be considered as the minimum distance between the source and the site in deterministic hazard analysis. Now, again you take seismic source 4. So, here the perpendicular distance might be falling like this, but certainly we will not take this part as minimum distance because source itself is starting from here. So, we have to find out minimum distance from the source not wherever the perpendicular distance is falling. So, we have to take if, if in this particular case for seismic source 4 the perpendicular distance or the point where the perpendicular from the site is falling it is located outside the fault that is not the part of the fault. When it is not the part of the fault certainly this is not the region in which rupture will happen. When this is not the region for rupture to happen why we will take that into hazard analysis estimation we will take minimum distance which is maybe from this particular end of the seismic source. So, this will be the minimum distance which will go into your ground motion prediction equation and based on the true potential or the rupture dimensions or the dimensions of the fault, we have already determined what is the minimum hypocentral uh, the, the minimum uh, maxim, the maximum potential for a particular seismic source. So, once we get all these uh, minimum distance and maximum parameter we can go to step 3. So, corresponding to each of source corresponding to different different values of seismic uh, uh, epicentral distance or hypocentral distance and taking the maximum potential earthquake or if we know the minimum distance from each source taking minimum distance and maximum magnitude we will try finding out which is the source which is giving you overall the maximum ground motion parameter. So, here we can see the magnitude of 
m1 the magnitude might be larger but the source it is corresponding to larger distance so magnitude is higher but distance is also higher as a result the ground motion parameter corresponding to a combination of m1 and r1 is lesser however combination of m4 happening at r4 distance from seismic source 4 it is giving you overall the maximum or the highest amplitude at your site of interest once this particular part is ready we can repeat the same procedure so firstly it is going to give me this is the controlling earthquake scenario based on uh, uh, deterministic seismic hazard analysis then define the hazard we can pick up all those whatever has been whatever just now i mentioned over here we'll take all the possible scenario for all seismic sources and pick up what is the overall maximum in step number 4 so if you are going with the uh, GMP which is acceleration based we may get p ground acceleration or spectral acceleration if we are going with velocity based GMP or displacement based GMPs your hazard analysis will be giving you p ground velocity p ground displacement or spectral velocity or spectral displacement values at your site of interest determined based on your deterministic seismic hazard analysis for the detail on uh, ground motion prediction equation synthetic ground motion also one can refer to lecture now based on deterministic hazard analysis we have understood that m4 happening at r4 is an indication of controlling earthquake so if we continue with this particular finding and if i am interested to find out the liquefaction potential of the site what i will do again corresponding to the liquefaction potential one can refer to my lecture of this particular course what we will do in order to find out a max value which will be required to find out cyclic stress ratio in liquefaction corresponding lecture i will be using some synthetic ground motion model taking synthetic ground motion regional parameters i will be generating ground motion corresponding to magnitude m4 at distance r4 from the site based on this particular uh, combination i will be generating some synthetic ground motion then pick up the motion which is corresponding to maximum amplitude as p ground acceleration which is referred as a max value in simplified approach for liquefaction assessment now earthquake potential regarding the earthquake potential there are that means we are interested to find out the maximum potential of the seismic source so there is it's like uh, one has to refer to combined decision with respect to what should be the true potential of a particular seismic source uh, in terms of maximum magnitude. So, there are number of um, experts which are required may be seismologists, geologists, engineers, risk analysts, economists and many more people even government officials will have a significant role in terms of giving inputs. One can also refer to uh, zonation maps of the country in order to narrow down to what is the potential magnitude earthquake on a particular region or on a particular seismic source. So, different terms are generally used some one uh, some terms are like maximum credible earthquake which is an indication of what is the maximum earthquake that appears to occur under known tectonic framework considering known tectonic uh, framework what is the maximum earthquake that can appear in a particular region or a particular site similarly design basis earthquake this is basically the earthquake corresponding to which you will be designing your infrastructure next one is safe shutdown earthquake if we are talking about nuclear uh, reactor buildings then corresponding to what ground motion what seismic scenario i should design my infrastructure such that, such that it gives an indication like the ground motion has reached to certain level that i have to shut down my facility so in order to decide that again there will be the, the corresponding scenario will be called as safe shutdown earthquake next is maximum pro, uh, probable earthquake that is maximum historical earthquakes also called as maximum earthquake which your site is likely to experience in next 100 years so everything all these uh, equations are like with respect to present what is the definition similarly operation basis earthquake it is the earthquake which is expected to occur during the design life of the structure so one is maximum potential earthquake one is design basis earthquake 
other one is operation versus earthquake and some of them one can distinguish in terms of what is the probability of occurrence of these earthquakes in, in terms of quantifying hazard analysis. So, one numerical problem just to discuss with whatever we have been discussing so far. So, here a site is given, the coordinates of the site are also given over here and with respect to this particular site, four seismic sources are given. Seismic source 1 is linear source, seismic source 4 is also linear source, then seismic 3 is there which is aerial source and seismic 4, two, 4 is there which is basically a point source. The coordinates are also given over here latitude, longitudes are also given over here and then the maximum potential earthquake which, which each of these seismic sources, each of these four seismic sources are capable of producing are also given in this particular m x value. So, seismic source 1 is capable of producing magnitude 7 on m w scale or moment magnitude scale and so on with others also or we can say the maximum potential is given in terms of moment magnitude. The focal depth corresponding to each source is also given over here because many a times your ground motion prediction equation you are going to use, it is taking into consideration not the epicentral distance where the site coordinate as well as the source coordinate can be used alone, we have to have an understanding about the focal depth. So, in order to find out hypocentral distance, we will be taking into consideration the focal depth as well as the epicentral distance between the source and your site corresponding to minimum distance. Again it is suggested that one has to use the following ground motion prediction equation where m refers to the magnitude, r refers to your hypocentral distance, f r which is given over here it is a for known value of r that is hypocentral distance, natural log of r by 100 or 0 whatever I mean in between these two whichever is the maximum value that will be considered as the value of f r. So, f r will go over here and c 1 to c 8 are the regression coefficients. So, one can refer to the ground motion prediction equation and find out the value of these coefficients corresponding to different different periods. And epsilon is the standard error terms in terms of the predicted ground motion parameter. So, this is the value of epsilon which is given over here. So, these are the details given what we will do in deterministic hazard analysis corresponding to each of the sites we will try finding out the minimum distance. You can see here the minimum distance for aerial source this will be the minimum distance for linear source depending upon the orientation of the slow, uh, source for S4 this is the minimum distance for S2 draw a perpendicular and then we will be able to find out the distance minimum distance with respect to S1 from the site. S2 it is just a point source, you will have one value of uh, epicentral distance. So, taking those coordinates, we can find out the epicentral distance or minimum distance in kilometers, taking the focal depth into account which is given in the question itself, one can find out how much is the hypocentral distance. Now, the magnitude is known, the value of r is known, we can put these equations, uh, these values of m and r and the value of regression coefficient from C1 to C8, what we can do, we can find out the value of peak ground acceleration because the, 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 the ground motion prediction equation which we have taken, it is to find out the value of peak ground acceleration. So, corresponding to each of these value of m and corresponding to each value of hypocentral distance, we will be getting p j value of 1, 2, 3, 4. So, 4 set of p j value we will get. Now, what we will do? We will compare all these 4 values and pick up which is the overall maximum value of p j a. That will be considered as deterministic seismic hazard based p ground acceleration for your site of interest. So, this is the value of p j a and among all those, what we got that 7 magnitude earthquake happening at source 1 occurring at minimum hypocentral distance of 86.29 with respect to source 1. Not we will not be finding out minimum distance among all the sources. No, we will be finding out only the minimum distance at source 1. So, and similarly for other sources individually. So, when source 1 is capable of producing magnitude 7 happening at hypocentral distance of 86.29 kilometer, my site is experiencing a peak ground acceleration of 0.14 g. Similarly, we can repeat the same 
changing the location of the site again these are the seismic sources four seismic sources perform hazard analysis for another grade point and repeat the same thing if you are if, if you are trying to attempt the deterministic seismic hazard map for a particular study area divide the entire area into number of grades and then perform the step which are shown over here after finding out the maximum potential earthquake and minimum hypocentral distance you will be able to find out deterministic seismic hazard value at each of the grid points when those values are there you can join the points corresponding to equal p ground acceleration values or equal spectral acceleration values which will give you the value of deterministic seismic hazard map for a particular study area now uh, in addition to hazard maps many a times you will be asked to find out what is the develop the design response vector so based on the two values that is magnitude and hypocentral distance we found out what is the maximum value of p ground acceleration we know that this particular value that means the coefficient values which are given over here these will be corresponding to some value of period so you say this one is corresponding to zero period similarly there will be subsequently more values corresponding to maybe 0.1 second 0.2 second as given in the corresponding gmp report or journal paper so every time you are taking the coefficients you are trying to find out the value of spectral acceleration corresponding to this particular period so if you are taking the value of coefficient mentioned over here and performing hazard analysis you will be getting the spectral acceleration corresponding to 0 second similarly values you are taking in corresponding to 0.1 second that will be spectral acceleration corresponding to 0.1 second and then that's how you keep on repeating the the procedure taking the value of coefficients at different different periods what you will be getting so this is again some uh, sim uh, example what you will be getting corresponding to zero period if you are taking the value of magnitude and distance you will be getting on spectral acceleration versus period uh, plot one value this is corresponding to zero period or call as p ground acceleration repeat the entire procedure which has just been discussed corresponding to different different periods you keep on updating the value of regression coefficients and perform the analysis what you will get you will get lot many more points and corresponding to every time like this is corresponding to 0.05 0.1 and like that so you will get lot many points join all those points you will get hazard analysis based response spectra again if i am using gmp corresponding to bedrock condition this is going to give me dsha based response spectra for bedrock condition so repeating the same procedure which is mentioned over here one can perform hazard analysis one can develop the response spectra for bedrock condition for outcrop condition or for different site class condition advantage in dsha it is it is very straight forward it is quite simple and you can even review if someone has performed it you can review or you can review your own calculation very easily and find out if the steps are clear but as i mentioned deterministic hazard analysis does not account whether the scenario which is coming as the outcome of deterministic hazard analysis it is going to get repeated during the design life so there is no uh, concept of frequency how frequently that ground shaking is occurring exactly whether the ground shaking in the future will happen only at minimum distance it's not also going to tell whether the the proposed seismic scenario is going to get exceeded or will remain Uh, will be exposed during the design life of the structure thus it completely ignores that always when there is magnitude involved the magnitude is happening at certain frequency at a particular site or a particular region or a particular source so that is completely ignored similarly it also ignores where the earthquake is going to come it also ignores whether this seismic scenario is going to get repeated during the design life or not as mentioned it is the objective of deterministic hazard analysis is to find out what is the maximum overall scenario for which if i design my building it will remain safe without being worried whether this scenario will actually hit my site of interest or not and there are lot of subjective decisions which are required because the value of hazard which you generally get from deterministic seismic hazard analysis will be significantly higher so many a time this is also a matter of discussion that the value is significantly higher with respect to codal provisions or with respect to probabilistic hazard values 
So there the subjective decision will come into picture. So thank you everyone. With this we have come to the end of uh, lecture 12. In lecture 13 we will be discussing uh, probabilistic hazard analysis. Thank you. Thank you.